Ladies, gentlemen, and others, welcome to Take Me Out to the Podcast, presented by HDFN. I am your host, Johnny Jackson, and today I have the absolute pleasure of speaking with Bailey from Foolish Baseball. His channel's flagship series, Baseball Bits, brings together analytical deep dives in his humor, packaged in a video game aesthetic. How are you doing today, Bailey? You know, I'm just uh, hanging in there. Happy to have baseball on at least. Uh, that's, that's something new over the past few weeks and uh, just interested to see how my channel grows with that uh, in place now. Yeah. Bailey's last video uh, on his channel featured the nastiest pitch in baseball, Tyler Glasnow's devastating curveball. And I think just a couple hours after that video was posted, Tyler Glasnow gave up an extra base hit on that curveball to Gio Urshela. That is correct. Do you, do you believe in jinxes? Um, lately I do because in an episode right before that, I said that I thought Christian Yelich had the best chance of hitting 400 as well. So that's not going great either. <laughs> He's picking it up. He had a homer last night. I mean, hope that could still happen. I mean, there's 40 more games left. Yeah, I'm rooting for him. I mean, at least I said there's another one where I did where I said Harper's underrated and he's off to a really hot start. So I'm not wrong all the time, just most of the time. Yeah. And uh, so in your earlier Baseball Bits videos, you used music from a lot of early Nintendo and Sega games and a few PS1 and PS2 games. Uh, however, in your more recent videos, you've leaned more towards independent music creators, specifically William Cage and Maxo. Uh, is there a particular reason for that? Yeah, I was just um, getting to, like, it was becoming a full-time job, and I was uh, worried about sort of this gray area copyright-wise, uh, so I just moved on to the uh, these independent composers that you speak of, and it's been fun working with them. It's good because I can also support their work, and you know, I, uh, I buy all their music, I, I support them via Patreon, and I, hopefully what I do also gives them exposure. And, and so it's been kind of like a, a win-win for both. No one needs to know, everyone knows Mario, you know, but maybe, maybe people should know William Cage and Max, so. Uh, and how did you hear about them? You know, I, I, it was just Google. Um, I, I'm an avid user of the website Bandcamp as well, so I think I was searching on Bandcamp to try to find people who fit what I was trying to do, and, and they definitely fit. I think most people haven't even really quite picked up on the fact that there was like a change in the soundtrack to that degree. Awesome. And so uh, you, you obviously had a profile in The Athletic uh, written by Stephen J. Nesbitt. Um, but also in The Athletic, your video on the 2011 draft was based on Dan Connolly's article. Uh, was that article given to you or did you have a choice of maybe a few articles? How was that specific topic chosen? Yeah, at time I had a, a deal in place with The Athletic where one of the videos I did would be based on an article, but uh, they gave me the creative freedom to choose the article. And uh, you know, there's a lot, if you compare my video to the article, there's a lot of kind of input I had in there. So they're very flexible to work with in that regard. So it wasn't really uh, restricting on you at all? No, I didn't find it to be too restricted creatively. In the art profile on you, Nesbitt mentioned that you went to a lot of open mic nights uh, earlier. Do you think that kind of helped you uh, refine your writing and maybe refine your humor that you use in baseball bits? Yeah, I think so to some degree. And um, I think another thing is that um, with baseball bits and foolish baseball becoming a thing like that, that itch is gone, like to do the open mic nights. Like now I have a way bigger platform than I ever did in a, you know, in a club with like 20 other people who are just waiting to have their five minutes as well. So it kind of works both ways. <laughs> and uh, what's been the most difficult video for you to make in terms of baseball bits? Um, that's a great question. The most difficult one, I think probably just the, in terms of, um, ambition, probably the one I made about Pedro Martinez, uh, the two seasons he had in 1999 and 2000, that video ended up being like 23 or 24 minutes long. And so at that point, it's like, I'm basically making a mini documentary or something. And, uh, I'm, I'm proud. I'm really proud of how it turned out, but I remember finishing it and being like, I never want to make a video that long again. How has a failure or apparent failure set you up for a future success? And do you maybe have a favorite failure of yours? Favorite failure? Well, I mean, there's many, but um, I think um, there was a time in my life where I, uh, I was living in Germany. I'd lived in Germany for a year. You might've read that in the article actually. Um, and I remember coming back from Germany and, and having the goal in mind to like work in baseball, but really being completely resigned to that there's no way I could possibly make it happen. I just didn't have, you know, the technical coding know-how to be like a numbers cruncher in a front office. I didn't really have like the, any connections in the industry to speak of. 
And so I just felt like completely dejected. And, you know, I had this YouTube channel that had 800 subscribers. And uh, the first time I made a, a baseball bits, which is, like you said, the flagship series, I probably got like 200 views or something like that. But then I kept making them. And I think by the time I got to the third one, it just blew up. And then that's kind of where I got to where I am now. But so I, I don't think, you know, my journey is a very lucky one. I, I faced, you know, some degree of adversity, but in many ways I got very lucky. The YouTube algorithm can um, expose your work um, to a lot of people really quickly. And, and that's both a blessing and a curse. We kind of live and die by it. But uh, I got lucky. And then that's what kind of set me up for future successes. What's one of the best or most worthwhile investments that you've ever made? Uh, it could be in terms of time, energy, money, energy, uh, anything. Yeah, I mean, I think definitely as far as just when I was starting to take the YouTube channel with a little bit of seriousness, I bought a microphone for $30 on Amazon. And um, I thought that made a huge quality difference for sure. Um, as far as just uh, time, I, I would say uh, any, any amount of time I spent reading a book about baseball has been really helpful in terms of me formulating ideas. And I think that reading in general is just a, a, a really good use of one's time. And it doesn't really, I think, even matter what you read. It doesn't have to be like a really challenging novel. You know, it, if, if your thing is like really trashy, like romance books, I think that's way better than not reading at all. So what are the uh, maybe two or three books that have been most important for you in growing as a person and a content creator? Yeah, well, so I'll say Moneyball. Um, that was probably the first baseball book I read that kind of got me thinking along these sabermetric lines. And I read that when I was like 12 or 13. So pretty, pretty formative age. Um, and then um, more recently, I would say, um, that's a good question. Um, I would say uh, another good baseball book I'm, I'm working on right now is called Future Value. It's by Eric Long and Hanging and Kylie McDaniel. Moneyball is by Michael Lewis, by the way, but I think a lot of people don't need me to tell them that. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, and that, that's, a, that's a book about um, scouting in baseball. Um, but yeah, and then, um, but yeah, and uh, I read a lot of like, uh, I read a lot of political philosophy as well. That's, that's kind of, uh, or, or history books as well. So um, Conquest of Bread, check it out. That's my suggestion. <laughs> Since you've started the Baseball Bits uh, series, what new belief, behavior, or habit has most improved uh, your life and maybe your quality of life? Um, I think I think the the amount of responsibility I have to have for myself to make this work is what's challenged me and, and also probably made me a better person. Um, you know, the way I see it, like if you work a regular like nine to five job, um, you can go into the office and just kind of have a lazy day. It, it happens to people. You get you go in, maybe you, uh, you're you chatting it up with your desk mate too much or, or something like that. Maybe you think to yourself, oh, I'll just take a long lunch today. And you can get through the day without having accomplished too much. Um, and I don't blame people who do that, by the way. I'm just saying that's, you can have good days and bad days. But with what I do, if I don't do anything, the work doesn't get done. And there's really just no way around that. So I have to be, when I when I'm working, I have to really set my mind to it because Oftentimes I do have deadlines to meet, whether it's personal deadlines I set for myself or it's deadlines that I have to meet in terms of like sponsors. So I think just having that level of responsibility in my job has, has challenged me in a way because I'm not, I'm not naturally like this, you know, uh, person who's really good at concentrating for a long time. I definitely have like some ADD, ADHD tendencies. I think we all kind of do, but um, yeah, that, that's what's really helped me grow as a person is that challenge to to really look at what I do and say, hey, if I don't buckle up right now, like just the work doesn't get done. And there's no one I can blame besides myself. Would you say that that's the biggest challenge or hardest part of continually making this content? I think so, yeah. I, I, th I think it's, there's an element of responsibility there that's, that's not really present if you, if you do a lot of work in say a team setting or um, yeah, or if just, uh, you, you know, people go to work for eight hours a day, but they don't work for eight hours a day is how I would put it. Whereas for me, you know, maybe I might only work five or six hours a day, but when I'm doing that, I'm working, you know. Do you maybe have a separate space versus like where you like live and hang out versus where you um, work? You kind of split those in your, in your mind? Yeah, I would, I would like that someday, but currently no. I mean, I'm sitting in my bedroom right now. I'm looking at the same computer screen that I use uh, to make a baseball, but it's the same screen I might use to play a video game later. So that, that, 
there's that demarcation between work and pleasure is tough. And sometimes I can find myself switching between the two pretty uh, nonchalantly throughout the day. So I try to really, you know, to, to deal with that, I, I really have to be like, okay, so from this block of time, I'm, I'm work Bailey, you know, this is all for foolish baseball. And then once I hit this certain time of the day, take a little break. So how, how have you, I guess, improved creating that balance in your life? Um, I think moving out was really key. I moved out of my parents' uh, place about a year ago now. Um, and that's kind of given me like, you know, 100% my own space to do that kind of stuff. Uh, before that, I, uh, I remember like, um, whenever I wanted to record a video, like the voiceover, uh, in order to find like the right setting for that, I had to like take my laptop out and record it like literally in the back of my hatchback in my parents' garage because just with like the soundproofing that's in a car, that was like literally the best place to get the audio. And now I don't have to do silly stuff like that quite as much anymore. But yeah, moving out with my, moving out my parents' place definitely helped out. And um, yeah, I, I, that, that's probably number one for me, to be honest. All right. Thank you so much for, for talking to me, Bailey. Uh, just to close it out, if there was any one person in the entire world, alive or dead, that you could sit down and talk to for 30 or 40 minutes, who would it be and why? Yeah, I mean, so I'm not like a overly religious or, or spiritual person, but I would just have to say Jesus. I think, uh, you know, so much of uh, of what we see in the world today is shaped by the life of uh, Jesus. And whether, you know, you think he's the, you know, the savior or not, that that's up to you. That's fine. But purely as a historical person, he definitely existed. And I think it'd be interesting to talk to him. Awesome. Bailey, thank you so much for talking to me today. And uh, yeah, that's basically it.